Today we're going to talk about NNRTI resistance. This is part two of a two-part series on resistance and interpreting genotype resistance assays. I'm going to talk about the commonly used NNRTIs, resistance that happens with these drugs, and also cross-resistance between the medications, which can be a major issue. So we'll talk about efavirenz, nevirapine, ropivirine, and then etravirine. And I'm going to be referring again to the Stanford database. If you haven't used this, this is a very powerful tool, and I'd recommend you try using this because you can learn a lot from it. So this is the website down at the bottom, and this is the home page. And once you get there, if you click this button in the upper right-hand corner, HIV Database Program, what that takes you to is a screen like this. So here you can plug in all the mutations that you got from your genotype resistance test and they'll give you an interpretation. So here on the upper left you can type in your reverse transcriptase mutations or you can go to the pull down menu. So I've, what I've done here is put in a K103N or alternatively you can go to the pull down menu and at position 103 click N. And then there's also a spot to put in protease mutations, or if you did an integrase genotype, you could put in your integrase mutations. And once you do that, what you get is an interpretation that looks like this. So here's the mutations you plugged in. Here's an interpretation such as you would get from a genotype assay. Tells you really susceptible or resistant. There are some comments about the mutations and what they do, and these comments can be very interesting and helpful. And then at the bottom, there's this box that shows you the mutation score or penalty score. And we're going to talk about that and look at that in more detail. So let's start with a common scenario. So in this case, a 32-year-old man presents after several missed vi visits to the clinic. He reports imperfect adherence to tenofovir emtricitabine efavirenz, which is atripla. His HIV RNA level or viral load has increased from undetectable to 3,410 copies. So you do a genotype resistance assay, and the result shows a K103N mutation. So the question is, are other NNRTIs an option for this patient? So in terms of efavirenz resistance, as I'm sure you all know, K103N is the most common mutation. It's generally the first to develop. In the setting of virologic failure, if a person were to stay on efavirenz, they could then develop these other mutations or accessory mutations. And the key point here to remember is that efavirenz has a long half-life and a low barrier to resistance. And so what that means is that when a person takes atripla with imperfect adherence, those days that they miss their atripla, the efavirenz is hanging out because of the long half-life, and they're basically getting efavirenz monotherapy. That's why resistance to efavirenz generally develops first, usually with the K103N mutation. And that can also happen if somebody stops atripla abruptly because the efavirenz hangs out for about two weeks. And that's why sometimes when we're stopping atripla, we give an NRTI tail so that they're not getting that efavirenz monotherapy for that week or two after they've stopped a tripla. Now, what does the K103N do? So here's that mutation score from the Stanford database that I've just blown up so you can see it a little better. So here's the mutation. Here are the NNRTI drugs. And here's a score. And the higher the number here, the worse the resistance. So a score, you can see here at the bottom, 60 or above indicates high level resistance, 30 to 60 intermediate. 10 to 30 low level, and less than zero is actually hyper susceptible. And what you see here is that the K103N causes high level resistance to efavirenz and also high level resistance to nevirapine. So here's that cross resistance that becomes an issue. What you see also is that you have a score of zero for rilpivirine and zero for etravirine if all you have is the K103N. So the key point here is that a 103N mutation knocks out efavirenz, also knocks out nevirapine. So nevirapine is definitely not an option. Rilpivirine remains active in vitro in the setting of a 103N, although we don't have a lot of clinical data for use of rilpivirine with the K103N present. So some caution is advised in that setting. Etravirine is definitely still active if the only NNRTI mutation is the 103N. If you have additional NNRTI mutations, 
that may not still be true, and we'll look at atrovirine resistance towards the end of the talk. Let's then turn to another case. So here, a 55-year-old man has had poor adherence to tenofovir amtricitabine, which is Truvada, and the Virapine, which is Viramune. His HIV RNA, or viral load, has risen to 1,250 copies. And the question is, what is the most likely nevirapine-associated resistance mutation? With virologic failure on nevirapine, the most common mutations to develop are those at position 181, with the most likely being a Y181C, though a 181I or V are also common. And one can also develop these other mutations. And if a person stays on nevirapine while failing, they can accumulate these mutations. And what I want you to remember is these mutations at position 181 for later when we talk about etrovirine resistance. Let's look at what the 181C does. And here we see a very different pattern than with the K103N. We see the 181C causes intermediate resistance to efavirenz, high level resistance to nevirapine, and then also intermediate level resistance to ropivirine and etrovirine. So here, a lot more cross resistance. The key point here is that the most common nevirapine mutation affects all of the NNRTIs, including etrovirine. So this is very different than what we talked about with the K103N. Let's then turn to what happens with failure on ropivirine. So in this case, a 35-year-old woman has imperfect adherence to tenofovir emtricitabine ropivirine, which is Complera. Her HIV RNA, or viral load, is 4,950 copies. And if you do a genotype here, what's the most likely ropivirine-associated resistance? So ropivirine resistance is interesting because the most common mutation is this E138K which was a mutation we really never talked about before ropivirine became available. So, and what's been shown in multiple studies is that with failure on Complera, so tenofovir emtricitabine and ropivirine, what generally develops is an E138K, that's the NNRTI resistance mutation, plus an M184I, that's an NRTI resistance mutation, similar to a 184V, but what generally develops here is a 184I. And what's been shown is that this 184I mutation both enhances or increases ropivirine resistance, causes emtricitabine resistance, just like a 184V would, and this is all at the cost of viral fitness. So like the 184V, it does affect viral fitness. But if a patient has virologic failure on Complera, this is the pattern we often see. There are other mutations that can occur with ropivirine failure, and with time failing ropivirine, these can accumulate. Let's look then at what this E138K mutation does and compare it to the 103N and the Y181C we looked at before. So here we see a lot of cross resistance affecting all of the NNRTIs, though not quite as bad as that 181C, but we have intermediate resistance to ropivirine low-level resistance to efavirenz, low to nevirapine, and low to etrovirine. So basically here we have low-level cross-resistance. But the point here is that NNRTI cross-resistance is more common with ropivirine than with efavirenz. If you compare this to that K103N mutation, here we have a lot more cross-resistance. So a disadvantage of Complera when you compare it to Atripla is if the patient fails Complera, NNRTI cross-resistance across the whole class of NRTIs is much more likely than if they fell atripla. So that's one comparison between Complera and atripla. Now then, let's look at etrovirine resistance. And this, I think, is a common scenario for everyone in their clinic. So here, a 45-year-old woman presents for an initial visit to your clinic. She can't recall the names of the antiretrovirals she was taking most recently, and she tells you she's been off them for about a month. So you get a viral load and then a genotype resistance assay, and you find these mutations under NNRTI-associated mutations. You have a K103N, a Y181I, and a P225H. So now we ask the question, is etrovirine an option for this patient? Here's the genotype. So this is an example of a real genotype from a patient. And what you see is those three mutations, 103N, 181I, and 225H. And your genotype just tells you 
a favarin's resistant, nevirapine resistant. This is an older genotype, but if there were ropivirine included on it, it would say ropivirine resistant. And then under etrovirine, it just says possible resistance. So if all you have is a genotype, it really doesn't tell you whether etrovirine is an option or not. So let's talk a little bit more about etrovirine resistance. So as we've mentioned, etrovirine may retain activity even if resistance develops to other NNRTIs. It really depends on the number of mutations and also which mutations they are. Similar to protease inhibitor resistance, with etrovirine, the higher number of mutations, the worse the resistance is, but certain mutations are worse than others. And as the mutations accumulate, the resistance doesn't occur necessarily in a linear fashion because some mutations are so much worse, the resistance can actually go up exponentially. And we'll look at that a little bit more on the next couple of slides. Now, the most significant etrovirin-associated resistance mutation is at position 181. As you recall, this is the same position as the most common nevirapine-associated resistance. Now, the best way to determine susceptibility to etrovirin is with a phenotype, but those are expensive and take a while to come back. So often what we do is we estimate the degree of resistance or the degree of susceptibility using a couple of different scoring systems. So there's the Duet scoring system that, that was developed by Thibaut Tech, and then Monogram has also developed a scoring system. And we'll look at those on the next two slides. So this is the Duet score. So these were developed by pairing genotype and phenotype samples. And here you have 17 etrovirin associated mutations, each with a weighted score. Again, a higher score is worse or indicates more resistance. And what you can see is the worst in terms of etrovirin resistance is this 181I or V. 181C is also pretty bad, as are these others on the second line. And this box at the bottom shows you the estimated response rate based on their total score. So a low score, 0 to 2, is the highest response, 2.5 to 3.5 intermediate response, and greater than equal to 4 as a total score, they call a progressively reduced response, because the, more, the higher score you get after that, the response goes way, way down. Generally, what I've seen reported is a score of 2 or higher indicates that etrovirine really should not be considered an option. Now here's the monogram score, and I put here the enhanced version. There was an um, initial score developed, and then uh, monogram did a little bit more research and added a few mutations to this and updated it for this enhanced score. Here you can see there's more mutations, and in my experience, this scoring system is a little bit more conservative than the Duet score. In the Duet studies, etrovirine was given with an optimized background regimen that always included boosted darunavir, so it really was always salvage. And for this monogram score, that was not always true. So I think this is slightly more conservative, but really there's a very high level of agreement between the two scoring systems. Actually, this author who's listed here at the bottom did a study where he compared the monogram score to the duet score and also to the Stanford database interpretation. And that study found a very high level of agreement between the three scoring systems. So overall, I don't think it matters that much which scoring system you use. So here, if you're using the monogram score, again, you add up and a higher number is worse. And in this study, a score of four or higher is what correlated to resistance on the phenotype assay. I've also seen reported the score of three or higher should be considered resistant. So here you're really thinking three to four or higher indicates etrovirine uh, will not be active as part of your next regimen. Now these scoring systems, there are some things that they don't take into account. As we talked about last week, there are certain NRTI mutations like TAMs and a 184V that have been shown to actually increase etrovirin susceptibility a little bit. These scoring systems don't take that into account. Clinically, we don't totally know what to do with that. So usually, I generally use these scoring systems and consider them to be a very good estimate of resistance or of etrovirin activity. So for our patient that we described in the case, if we look at the resistance here, this person had a 181, which would indicate a score of 4, plus a 225H, which would indicate a score of 1 for a total score of 5. And actually, even though that genotype said possible resistance, we would consider etrovirin to be resistant 
and not definitely not fully active. So just to summarize, with a Favrins, K103N is the most common mutation, and that also knocks out nevirapine. With nevirapine, there's lots of mutations that are possible, but the 181C is the most common, and remember that causes more etrovirin cross-resistance. With ropivirine, E138K is the most likely NNRTI mutation, and with complera failure, often a 184I also develops. Remember that with the 138K, you have more NNRTI cross-resistance as compared to with a Favrin's failure. And then with etrovirine, remember that it depends on the number of mutations and the type of mutations, and there are several scoring systems you can use to estimate the degree of resistance. So I'll stop there and take any questions.